right, I've got another game to share with you and some interesting lessons that I've learned in this game with, uh, with my opponent that is worth taking a gander at. My opponent is white and I played black. He opens with a really interesting move. Now, I, I know there's been criticisms of this move, but this is not uh, that bad of a move. I went ahead and pushed my pawn to e5, a central pawn, and he immediately fianchettos his bishop, grabbing a beautifully long diagonal into my king side once I castle. So this is not necessarily a lousy opening. I'm going to develop my knight. My opponent's going to bring up his c pawn to c4 and gain this very important d5 square, a central square. So you can see already, even though he's opening on the wing, he has brought his bishop out and he has claimed one of the central squares with his pawn, and so there is a battle for the central part of the board. And this is critical to do. I'm going to put some muscle into this center and I'm going to bring out my bishop. And now he matches my king pawn up. And I want to make sure this king pawn stays solid. I also want to give my bishop here support. Now notice, by definition, my bishop is a bad bishop. Because my pawns, my central pawns, are the same color as my bishop. However, that's only a definition. In this instance, my bishop may be bad, but it's active. I am outside of this pawn structure in the center. So I am wielding some very good influence on the chessboard, even though the bishop's bad. Uh, I know Jeremy Silman talks about this a lot, the bias about the labels of a bad versus good bishop. He says a better labeling system would be an active versus an inactive bishop. My bishop in this game is really truly quite active. Now he's building up his center support in his pawns and this is becoming a very interesting closed game. Now at this point I just got done telling you well my bishop is bad but he's active however his bishop on this powerful diagonal is his good bishop. His central pawns are on the light squares. So I'm going to be more than happy than a pig in mud to exchange these bishops, and that is precisely what I do at this point. And of course, it's a virtual forced situation. He must exchange the bishops. So he does. Instead of responding with the pawn take the bishop, do you see a better move? Absolutely. Put my knight on the outpost. I've ranted and raved about knights on outposts and shown you many, many Grandmaster games on this particular type of strategy. That is wonderful. Now look at that knight. That knight isn't going to be chased away. The two pawns that can come to this square or this square to chase the knight away are already past that knight. That is simply a mouth-watering outpost. The only way he's going to get rid of that knight is to exchange it off with one of his powers. I'm very happy about this situation and sure enough, here comes his knight challenging my knight. Silman also discusses the idea of reactionary chess. Reacting to every one of your opponent's moves and not having a plan of your own. I try very hard in my games not to do that. Here I ignore the threat to my knight and I castle. And he follows suit. He castles. There's no real rush to exchange knights as of yet. And now I think, okay, I'm going to try to get my other knight on this other delicious square as an outpost toward his king side. And now this is starting to get good. 
it's at this point because he saw me bring my knight here and he knows I'm going to there. It's at this point that he exchanges the knights. Do I have to react to everything my opponent does? No, I do not. If you do that, you find yourself playing losing chess. At this point, I was thinking, you know, he's got a bishop out and a knight. I've only got a knight, and it's on the rim. I'm going to bring my queen over here to g5, coming directly at his king with a helper knight. And, of course, I lose the opportunity to get that knight. He moves it over here in the middle of nowhere land. That doesn't phase me at all. So what do I do? I bring my bishop down to h3 and I pin his g2 pawn. My next move is going to be checkmate. My queen is going to come and take that pawn and checkmate the king. So this is why, in my opinion, it was okay to ignore exchanging the knights. I've already got this game won, except for one major factor. He brings his bishop to here at f3, protecting his g2 pawn. So now I can't do the checkmate, but my development and my attack and my plan is much stronger. I'm going on the attack. He's let me into this. I press my f-pawn to f5, again going into the center. He takes the pawn with his pawn. I bring my rook to take his pawn, and now look at my position. I have a rook, a queen, a knight, and a bishop bearing down very hard against his king. He has one bishop protecting the pawn and one knight out here doing nothing. That's it. That's all he's got. My development is superior. My position is superior at this point, but those are temporary advantages. Now watch what my opponent does. He brings his bishop up to here, up to here, to d5, puts me in check. Now, do I all of a sudden have to live in holy terror because all of a sudden he is counterattacking? No, I do not. I take my bishop out of check. It's that simple, man. Just take your bishop out of check. However, look what my opponent does. Now my opponent takes the c7 pawn and forks my rook. Now, do I have to completely give up everything I've been doing to start reacting to his threats. No, I do not. I recognize his bishop is still controlling this diagonal, supporting this pawn, and he's getting a little bit of counterplay. So I patiently respond at this point to his moves without giving up what I'm trying to accomplish. And of course, he's going to put his knight right here, threatening my queen. Now look at the setup. Now this is interesting, because he's got a really good support system here for his bishop and his knight, and he is getting some counterplay, and he's slowly getting closer to my king. Do I have to start rushing everything back and giving up on my idea down here? No, I do not. I'm not playing reactionary chess at this point. I'm simply responding to a few threats. Notice something interesting here. He is counterattacking me with only two pieces, a bishop and a knight. The rest of his army is essentially staying home. Granted, it's a counterattack, and he's trying to disrupt my plan, but he needs to do better than this if he's going to win this game. Of course, I move my queen out of danger, up to g6. And now, he comes zipping down here and he nabs himself another pawn. Now you can see he's destroyed my queen side and he's threatening my rook. 
So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go back here. He's still holding this diagonal to this pawn. He knows when he gives up that diagonal, he's going to lose. And now he comes here, and he gives me a beautiful skewer with my rook and queen. So at a bare minimum, my rook is lost. There's nothing I can do about that. Okay? Do I give up on the issue? No, I do not. I recognize his knight is unguarded, so I threaten his knight by bringing my other rook into play. You notice how I step by step beat back his counterattack because he only has two powers that he's using. I have involved the entire concept of my army with the pawns. He has not. You can't win chess doing it this way. So he moves his knight down here, once again threatening my rook. I bring my rook up, once again threatening his knight, and he pulls his knight completely out of the game. And I recognize I'm going to lose this rook. Because I'm not going to move my rook and lose my queen. So, give him the rook. <laughs> it's okay. I will replace this rook with my other rook. Give him the rook. And he takes the rook. And I go checkmate. If you're willing to lose a little bit of material when your opponent gives you a counterattack, especially if you already have a well-developed plan and an attack, it's okay to sacrifice some material for the greater good of defeating your opponent and winning your game. Now granted, this isn't Grandmaster Chess. Very little chess I see on the YouTube videos is Grandmaster Chess. It's a lot of us amateurs working through our understandings and developing our chess prowess. I was recently told that my chess sucks. That's true. That's because I'm a beginner. In the process of playing game after game after game after game and trying to practice the idea of developing a plan and working with the imbalances on a chessboard, I suspect my chess will get to the point to where someone can't just say, your chess sucks. Right now it does suck. But practicing Jeremy Silman's ideas of imbalances, development of a plan, putting your pieces on the right place in the board to carry out your plan, sometimes it works. And it's beginning to work more often with me. For every game I show you on YouTube videos that I, loot, that I win, I have six to eight to ten more behind me that I've already lost. I can't show you every game of chess I play because it would overwhelm YouTube with a nincompoop who is trying to improve his chess. <laughs> That's not the funnest way to do it. What excites me is when I find a way to utilize the principles Jeremy Silman is teaching me in his chess course, which is his chess books, then I love showing you so that you can see how it works. There is a dynamic in chess that you can manipulate to strengthen your game and weaken your opponent. And that's the whole point of the game, isn't it? <laughs> so I wanted to share this game with you to show you that as you practice and learn how to read the chessboard, we all can improve our chess. So happy checkmating, and I'll see you in the next video.